We are building the first interplanetary ship. We want to make sure there's a seed of human civilization somewhere else. It's important to get a self-sustaining base on Mars. Aloha, I'm Josh Burstein, and today is my last day on Earth. Let's face it, the Earth is not doing so hot. If it's not all the temperature weirding or global pandemics that are going to get us, it's robots or aliens. Armageddon or not, scientists around the world are working on contingency plans. I'm here in Hawaii, one of the most lush places on Earth. Land of palm trees, chirping birds, Kona coffee, pizza with weird toppings. But that's not why I'm here. I'm headed to one of the most inhospitable places on this planet to simulate what would happen if we had to drop everything and move to space. After cold calling NASA, true story, I found myself on a research mission to the first ever simulated moon base. Think of it as the next level of social distancing. I'll be quarantined in and around a 1,200 square foot dome for two weeks with a small international crew of astrobiologists, engineers, and geologists. Real World Lunar Edition is part of ongoing research in the space community to learn how humans will survive the harsh and isolating conditions of other planets. When we go to survive on the moon and Mars and other harsh environments, it's all about psychology. It's all about what are people going to eat? What are they going to do? Uh, how are they going to behave towards each other? Survival depends on everybody cooperating. Hank Rogers is steward of our space dome, an entrepreneur that made his wealth on Tetris, so he knows how to lay down the first bricks. Can you paint us a bit of that vision of that first lunar outpost and why you'd build something like this? The last time we went to the moon, it was because of a space race with the Russians. It's just the wrong reason. It's like doing it for the Olympics. My mission is to make a backup of life on Earth by going to other planets. How close are we to that? The first base, I'd like to see at the end of the next decade. You can see 100 years from now, we'll be doing that flight to the moon, have a, a leisure time, and then come back and tell your friends about it. Why not? The moon is our eighth continent. It's a place where we are going to settle. Actually, I plan in 20 years to retire on the moon. Bernard Fong is a senior scientist at the European Space Agency and was the principal scientist for the first European mission to the moon. When Tom Hanks says, Hawaii, we have a problem, he's talking to Bernard. He'll be my eyes in the sky at mission control. And he's right. Humans will be colonizing the moon sooner than later. 2040, you will have 100 people there. In 2050, you will have 1,000. It's the adventure of all of us. That's right. You can go to the moon too, which explains how someone who never got better than a B in a high school science class got on board this mission. My job as Average Joe is test what the biggest challenges are for survival. Do you have any specific advice for someone about to go into the hat? Have fun. <laughs> You're going up there for the first time. It's so exciting. It's like, yeah, you'll come back and you'll have all these stories. Uh, for me, the, the, the most interesting part was going into the lava tubes and exploring. Lava tubes? Okay, that sounds interesting. It was time to get off this rock. I was off to meet my commander, Michaela Musalova. If Hank and Bernard are focused on the human condition in space, Michaela brings scientific expertise. She explained why Hawaii is the perfect place to build a moon base. It's very new, and that's because it's made essentially by volcanic activity. Most of what we see, the hills are all volcanoes or cinder cones, like uh, the one you see just here, it's called a pu'u. And that means that the landscape is almost untouched. There's no vegetation, no greenery, and that's what gives it that kind of uh, otherworldly feel that you might be on the moon or Mars, because in a similar way, Mars is, for example, covered in lava flows. And actually, Mauna Loa, the volcano in which the habitat is built, is still an active volcano. When you'll be living there during the mission, you will feel like you're on another planet. <laughs> Driving towards the active volcano. Is my <laughs> you keep that in the back of the mind that we are actually, we're going to be living on an active volcano. I was in a rush to leave Hawaii's lush paradise and head into alien territory. I'd definitely miss it later. Observing the change in scenery was remarkable. Within half an hour, all signs of vegetation were completely gone. The only contrast? was brown and orange space rock. Michaela took me on an advanced expedition to explore some of the more unique terrain. This is a lava tube, and it may be the key to our first real adventures on the moon and Mars. When volcanoes erupt on Earth, or anywhere in the known universe, lava flows down, 
cutting through the landscape like skis on fresh powder. When lava hardens, it doesn't necessarily form a flat layer. Lava flows can layer on top of each other to form pockets, caves, and tunnels. These channels have already formed a network of caves that humans can use as natural shelter when we arrive on other planets, just like early cavemen and women used at the beginning of human civilization on Earth. Ready to explore your first lava chamber? I am ready. This is some outer space stuff. So what we're seeing here, this kind of tunnel, is the outside crust of a lava flow. And we suspect that similar things have been happening on uh, Mars and even on the Moon. And so they're interesting for us uh, for two main reasons. First of all, as an astrobiologist, I'm hoping to find life elsewhere in space. And lava tubes are a perfect place for life forms to hide. Uh, microbes can find refuge in these kind of environments because they're sheltered from the outside. There's a lot of moisture. They can get a lot of nutrients from the rocks around them. And then as people who are you know, trying to push colonization of these other planets, we could technically build shelters in here. And this is, of course, a very small lava tube, but some of the other ones we're going to explore during the mission are huge, like you could build a house inside. I'd gotten a sneak peek inside my first lava tube. It was time to see where I'd be living for 14 days. At last, I had arrived at my lunar Airbnb. Here it is, dome sweet dome. I'm gonna live in that. Two car garage for two weeks. Imagine this 1,200 square foot dome is your home for 14 days. You'll be sharing this space with five other astronauts, and the only time you'll ever leave is if you're conducting a mission critical to the safety or survival of your crew. What will you do? How will you stay healthy? How will you get along with the people you live with? Welcome to life on another planet. You want to have a look inside? This is going to be your home for the next few weeks. Hopefully it won't be too claustrophobic for you. You'll see this space here, mm -hmm. unfortunately, in terms of surface area to walk and function on, is small. Because here is where we'll be exercising and working oh. and eating and, you know, cooking just around the corner. And suddenly you realize this is not actually that much space for six people. When you think about it, the first thing to break down in space will be the people and not the machines. The HAB is designed to learn how the average person endures the extreme rigors of space life. This is the end of the tour. That is not something I was expecting because I, I figured there'd be a workout area. I figured there'd be a dinner table and it is just more use this same square yeah. footage. It's for... basically a multifunction room. But I this do... kind of big <laughs> ceiling gives you a feeling you're not choking. But once you see your room, then you might change your mind about the <laughs> claustrophobia. Pretty tiny. Yeah. And already with these doors closed, there's not great air circulation in here. You might start to feel claustrophobic with the lights off. It's pitch black. And some people, you know, don't take that very well. And then the food will kind of add to another <laughs> sense deprivation sure. after a while. Oh, right. There are no delivery guys in space. Cooking is going to be actually very difficult. Basically, most of your food is powdered. So this is, for example, that's zucchini. freeze dried zucchini. This is what it looks like. So it's, you know, you can see these little bits of <laughs> what used to be rather big chunks of zucchini. If you were to eat this right now, it would probably break your teeth. So you really want to put it into a lot of water, let it soak up for even several hours, and only then you can cook it and actually attempt to eat it. So kind of like, like beans. Imagine it as if everything were beans. Suddenly a very clear metaphor was taking shape. Beans. Space is beans. There are no frills. Living in fake space will not necessarily be fun. As I stared at my new reality, I wondered if I had what it takes to be a space pioneer. The aloha vibes Hank and Bernard passed on to me, excitement to explore space caves and discover alien life forms, it all started to fade. I realized just how hard space life will be. What earthling amenities could I get by without? Will I be outcast by far more qualified fellow crew? Did I have the right stuff? Well, only one way to find out. <laughs>